Excellent. So, uh, good evening, everyone who uh, 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 joined us. Um, so, this is, uh, I should say, second lecture of my laryngology um, uh, lectures, which, which, which is a huge topic in itself. So, uh, in this lecture, I will be mainly covering uh, laryngomalacia, uh, recurrent re respiratory papillomas, cord palsies, and just briefly touch on um, you know, um, three, four other uh, pathologies if we have time. So uh, laryngomalacia. So the main um, thing I'll start by saying, especially for uh, you know, ENT trainees, um, and or whosoever is listening that, you know, all strider is not laryngomalacia. So, um, you know, pediatricians, or I should say, um, you know, some general pediatricians in uh, smaller district hospitals uh, label everything uh, uh, sort of remotely uh, like strider as laryngomalacia. Yes, of course, laryngomalacia is uh, the uh, most common cause of strider, yes. Uh, you know, nearly uh, three quarters of all the cases of Strider are due to laryngomalacia. But I think it is the, the key thing is the history. I mean, not just on the telephone, but almost you can uh, make a diagnosis if you take a decent history, um, you know, from your referring physician. So, first of all, it's not present at birth. Uh, it usually presents uh, within a few days to weeks uh, um, after birth, classically is uh, four to six weeks uh, after delivery. Um, it's and it's not necessarily that it's uh, more common in um, preterm or term babies. So can be either. Of course, you'll take the history of uh, yeah, prematurity. And again, uh, it's a typical squeaky inspiratory strider, which is variable. And I think that's the key thing here. It's uh, Worse in uh, certain situations, especially when the child is crying or feeding, or if it gets excited or upset, or if the child is lying uh, flat on his back, uh, with at times if the neck is flexed. So I think this is a classical uh, history uh, that you need to um, ask or get out of the parents. So interestingly, here the cry is normal. There's no hoarse uh, cry or no cry. Uh, yes, the child is able to feed, but it's a slow feed because the child just essentially gets tired uh, or can't uh, coordinate uh, breathing and uh, feeding. Um, there's no history of uh, cyanosis. It is uh, a, a more common boys uh, as compared to girls. Nobody really knows uh, uh, the etiology, why this happened, but so, you know, we, of course, explain to the parents uh, that it's, uh, you know, floppy larynx. So that's what it is. It's essentially flaccidity or in some sense, in coordination of the supralaryngeal structures. Again, nobody knows why, but there is some association with the uh, reflux disease. There these are various uh, different types of uh, uh, laryngomalacia. These are just, uh, you know, pictorial representations. Uh, and yeah, it, it is somehow inward collapse of the uh, epiglottic folds or the arytenoids. That's the most common one. The epiglottis can be uh, curled up uh, as shown in uh, these pictures, uh, almost uh, what's called the omega shaped epiglottis. Um, there will be some um, uh, collapsing movements of the arytenoid cartilages. And Yes, shortened area epiglottic uh, fold. So these are the key findings uh, on a flexible uh, or a rigid uh, endoscopy. So management wise, um, yes, you know, um, if a general pediatrician or a general uh, ENT surgeon is seeing these kids uh, in, the, uh, in their outpatient uh, clinics, uh, Yes, if uh, the child is uh, thriving well, the history fits in, if they are able to scope, even if just on the basis of history, if the child is thriving well, um, they will do well. But by the time they get referred to us in the tertiary uh, uh, centers, I will, yes, unless it was absolutely barn door and, you know, 
and the kid is thriving and all that. Uh, I have a very low threshold of uh, scoping just because of the practice uh, uh, that I have. Um, and airway endoscopy, I do, of course, one, to confirm my diagnosis, but also to exclude other pathologies. Um, what that means is if you uh, look at the literature, the literature will say that 20% uh, of the kids with laryngomalacia have a, another pathology. In my personal series uh, of these kids with laryngomalacia, this 40% have uh, other pathologies, but it's a bit of a skewed uh, you know, practice because you know a standard uh, thriving kid with laryngomalacia doesn't get referred to us. So yes, a majority of these kids, you don't need to do anything. It's just uh, a matter of uh, uh, watchful um, and waiting and that uh, itself corrects or resolves. Um, and surgery is uh, reserved for severe cases only. And, you know, surgery uh, comes in under the umbrella of uh, supraglottoplasty. So this is just uh, a classical uh, rigid endoscope picture. You can see omega-shaped epiglottis, very shortened area epiglottic folds. It almost looks more like what I would call a tubular uh, epiglottis. And you can see the arytenoids are gently uh, collapsing in. And it's this a retinoid prolapse, which uh, uh, gives that squeaky uh, inspiratory um, sound. So, aryepiglottoplasty. Uh, um, I think over time, um, we have all become very conservative uh, regarding the surgical uh, treatment of uh, uh, aryepiglottoplasty. So, I'm, I'm just going to go through as to what used to be done. Um, more or less, these days, all we do is a division of the area epiglottic fold in majority of the cases. But of course, there are uh, um, various other uh, uh, sort of uh, accessions uh, which used to be done before, can still be done, but they do come uh, with their own uh, significant complications. You know, epiglottopexy or literally stitching the epiglottis uh, to the uh, tongue base removal of redundant mucosa. You can literally excise all the mucosa over the arytenoids. Um, but that does or can lead to significant scarring. Tracheostomy, almost never. So this is just for illustration uh, purposes as to how the epiglottoplasty works. So this is uh, was a different child uh, with laryngomalacia. And uh, once we and it's literally these, this is where you'd make your uh, step. Many times, especially in the exam, you might be shown this picture and asked uh, that, oh, where exactly you go to make a cut. And, you know, quite a few people will say, oh, there, because that looks like an obvious fold. But that's the glossoepiglottic fold. This is the arytenoid epiglottis, eri epiglottic fold. This is the one. Uh, you will make the cut in or the cut will be in that direction or you will just follow the epiglottis. So the next uh, picture illustrates the same child that you just now saw. Uh, and suddenly you can see uh, from a supraglottis, which looked very tubular, has opened up, almost opened up like a flower. And that's it. That's all you need to do. A few millimeters uh, cut. And this is a uh, cold steel uh, aryepiglottoplasty, which is uh, what uh, I prefer to do. Yes, of course, uh, there are surgeons who um, would do this uh, with laser also. Nothing wrong with it. Yes, you know, be aware of the risks, uh, uh, the complications, the risks that come with it. So, again, important and a common exam question and the complications of uh, uh, aryepiglottoplasty. And the main one which we worry about is supraglottic stenosis. It's a very difficult one if you, for example, done extensive uh, resection of all the mucosa over here, uh, and you know it leads to scarring. There isn't any way you can fix it. It's a very uh, difficult complication um, to treat, and hence over time people have become so conservative. Uh, about uh, any epiglottoplasty that, you know, some surgeons I'm aware of will only do unilateral uh, supraglottoplasty um, at, at, at in the first sitting. Um, yes, there are other, again, it's uh, if you're uh, being um, sort of 
um, overexcited and start excising stuff, uh, you know, cricoretinoid fixation, posterior glottic stenosis. So these are the, um, and I haven't mentioned here, but quite important still um, for an extensive resection, aspiration. So um, these are, be aware of uh, uh, stenosis and aspiration if uh, you're not, uh, you know, being careful, but yeah, essentially conservative uh, surgery if you uh, are planning to operate. So that's uh, laryngomalacia. Um, moving on to, to reoccurrent respiratory papillomatosis, a huge topic, um, and uh, I will uh, hopefully touch on most of the uh, important aspects, and you will uh, see this uh, such a common condition again. So papillomas, of course, you, you know, can occur anywhere, um, literally from the tip of the nose to the larynx. Um, they are uh, almost uh, strawberry-like exophytic uh, uh, lesions uh, that they tend to reoccur, and of course, they can spread. So I will, uh, though, of course, it's a pediatric talk, but I will touch a little bit uh, on the uh, adult uh, uh, onset uh, reoccurrent respiratory papilloma, just so that you understand uh, the similarities uh, or the differences. Of course, so the broad classification is uh, juvenile onset, juvenile onset um, and the other group is the adult onset. This is a, one of the very severe uh, cases. Uh, so this kid uh, clearly let's me and you can see uh, the papillomas are through the uh, trachea right down uh, to the uh, main bronchus, very severe uh, condition. And this is, you know, the extreme end of the uh, spectrum. Right, so there is a bimodal uh, distribution, meaning um, what, what we see in uh, pediatrics uh, is uh, uh, generally uh, between the ages of two to four. And of course, then it's the uh, from age uh, 20 to 40 years of age. Um, in children, it is uh, papillomatosis is the most common benign uh, lesion of the larynx. And it is uh, the second most common cause of hoarseness uh, after vocal nodules. So, um, so my take home message here, and that's what I follow any child who is having persistent hoarseness, anything more than uh, two months, I would rather scope, and I mean scope properly and rule out papillomas. Yes, you know, majority of the times it might just be you know, vocal nodules, but what you don't uh, want is uh, label a hoarseness uh, as nodules. Um, and, you know, a few weeks uh, or months later, they present to the a and &E, an extremist. So be aware uh, that initially it, the only symptom might be hoarseness. Uh, it is, of course, not that common. Um, um, so you have four in 100,000 children. And the younger the age at first presentation, in the long run, it's going to be a, a more severe disease. And just touching on the adult onset one, uh, less common than uh, kids, two in 100,000. Uh, again, more common in men than women. Adult onset is less aggressive uh, than juvenile, juvenile onset. And it's usually in adults, a solitary uh, uh, papilloma or just a few clumps of uh, papillomas rather than the extensive ones that we see in kids. And these adult ones, again, um, you know, the, yes, they also need repeat procedures, but just, just for uh, comparison's uh, sake, you know, adults might need max uh, sort of five procedures over the lifetime, but um, in, in kids, uh, it can go up to uh, 20 procedures uh, in their lifetime. So, of course, it's the uh, human papilloma virus. Um, the common ones are type 6 and 11. Um, type 16 is a rare one. So, viral, viral typing should be done uh, in the initial uh, uh, workup uh, when you, and of course, initially when you see the kids or ideally every time, but of course, uh, we're all guilty, including myself. Uh, we don't send for histology all the time. Yes, first time around, first uh, 
few times you should definitely send for viral typing as well as histology. So type 16 is a rare cause uh, and uh, it, this is the one which uh, is associated with increased risk of uh, malignant uh, transformation. And uh, as you're aware, so HPV is a double-stranded DNA uh, virus. So it targets the uh, epithelial cells. It might just be uh, sitting there latent and something happens, some you know, immune deficiency and it just flares up. Um, so between 11 and 6, type 11 has worse prognosis and hence uh, it's worth knowing the, uh, uh, what, what viral type uh, we're dealing with. So there has been uh, a link to uh, maternal uh, condylomas which has been established uh, regarding the transmission. Um, so yes, direct contact in the birth canal there is a, a, a mention about uh, a possibility of a transplacental spread as well. Um, so there is uh, one in a hundred children uh, delivered by a C-section can still develop uh, RRP. There is uh, again some evidence about uh, post-nasal exposure. Yes, a risk of transmission uh, in the maternal condyloma is very variable. So another thing, um, as surgeons, be aware, the HPV doesn't get transmitted by uh, casual contact, uh, so won't uh, be worried. Risk factors um, for kids, uh, there's a typical triad of uh, firstborn, born child, vaginal delivery, and mother with the condylomas. While in the adults, it's more uh, multiple sexual partners, uh, oral sex, and, um, you know, there might be a latent uh, virus with immune deficiency, uh, it flares up. Histology-wise, uh, these are essentially uh, non-keratinized stratified uh, finger-like uh, uh, projections. So papillomas are typically seen uh, or arise at the junction between the respiratory and the squamous uh, epithelium. And hence, uh, you know, of course, we try our best to avoid uh, tracheostomy um, these days. And again, because tracheostomy is going to um, give you an iatrogenic uh, squamocolumnar uh, junction with more papillomas. So the common sites, uh, as I said, it can be anywhere from uh, the nasal uh, vestibule area to the nasal pharynx um, and the epiglottis, the ventricles uh, around the vocal cords and further down into the uh, uh, main uh, trachea and the bronchi. Clinical features, classically, again, there's a triad. Um, it can be one or a combination of uh, so hoarseness, which is not getting better or rather getting worse. Um, think of papillomas or exclude or rule out. Um, by the time the kid starts having strider, it is already late. Um, and, you know, many times kids can present to the a &E in significant uh, distress. Uh, extra laryngeal spread happens, much more common in uh, kids, so one third of the kids can have an extra laryngeal spread. Of course, uh, can happen also in adults. <clears throat> so be aware, uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, it can just present as a chronic cough or choking, which are very vague symptoms, uh, pneumonias, failure to thrive, and uh, dyspnea. So, you know, all I'm trying to say is have a low threshold of uh, a formal airway endoscopy. And I should say in uh, uh, primary care, they can be uh, labeled as asthma or croup, or, you know, it's going to go away with an allergy, laryngitis, bronchitis, because these things are common uh, in kids. Uh, so be, be aware. So, uh, outcomes well either it's going to go away on its own or it's not um, and but be aware uh, that once you've followed up a kid 
these things can reoccur after many years of remission um, because uh, if the virus is still there in the cells and uh, uh, some immune deficiency event happens that can flare up. And uh, we already have uh, mentioned about malignant transformation. Um, again, it, this doesn't uh, change uh, with or during uh, puberty. So uh, we mentioned again uh, already, so most common presentation is uh, these exophytic lesions which just keep reoccurring. I'm afraid uh, kids can die of this um, and that could be simply due to frequent surgical procedures or complications thereof. And respiratory failure if the papillomas keep extending down uh, the uh, bronchi um, and you know bronchopulmonary involvement um, is not that uncommon. Uh, up to 10% of kids uh, can have uh, bronchopulmonary involvement. Malignant transformation is rare. Uh, not many cases uh, in kids have been reported. Yes, you know, 20, 30 kids uh, have been reported. That video that I showed you uh, through the tracheostomy, um, you know, that uh, kid uh, was. Uh, you know, I used to come very regularly during my fellowship years at GOS and yeah, unfortunately uh, uh, had malignant transformation and uh, died. Um, in adults, uh, so yes, malignant transformation, if it happens, it's fatal. So most common uh, is uh, in adults with risk factors, if they're, uh, you know, uh, tobacco, um, sort of uh, smoking, previous radiotherapy, uh, or we mentioned uh, HPV type 16. Um, site again for malignant transformation in adults, it's uh, mainly in the larynx, while in kids, it's further beyond uh, sort of bronchopulmonary. So it depends on you know, where you're assessing the kids, but it can be anywhere. So if this is a kid in your clinic, we you might simply present with hoarseness. Um, or, you know, you might be facing these kids for the first time in an a &E setting uh, with worsening uh, strider. And of course, if uh, the kid presents to you almost an extremist, you've got to start uh, thinking of uh, moving the child direct um, or straight away to theater because what really we are trying to avoid here is a tracheostomy. And you just have to debulk and uh, um, almost core out an airway. And uh, classically, as compared to laryngomalacia that we mentioned, for RRPs, the strider does not uh, change its position. Um, yes, you know, depends on how uh, bad uh, the scenario is. If the kid is not that bad, certainly attempt a flexible laryngoscopy. If it's not possible, we have to uh, think uh, of moving the ch child straight to theta. The various staging systems, as far as you document, uh, uh, what you did, where exactly the papillomas are, so that next visit, uh, you know, um, you know, as compared to how the progression has been. So, what we'd really like to do, of course, is eradicate uh, the, the disease, uh, achieve a good airway, and not mess up uh, the voice uh, as far as possible. Surgically, there are uh, lots of options. Um, you know, just cold instrumentation, you know, just uh, scissors and forceps. Microdebrider has really revolutionized how we do this. Um, CO2 lasers also is on the table. There are some surgeons uh, who uh, are very fond of that. Um, and KTP laser also uh, can be used, especially if there's a you know, further down, you know, say a lesion in the uh, right vein bronchus. You just cannot uh, get to that area with any of the other instruments. So it's uh, it's an option. You can use a ventilated bronchoscope with a KTP laser. So um, microrib rider is almost, I will call it the gold standard now. Um, use a 3.5 or 4 millimeter skimmer um, angled blade. Um, it is uh, safer and more accurate uh, than laser. Um, and of course, using a rigid endoscope, you can also remove uh, tracheal lesions. 
So yes, CO2 laser um, uh, is an option. Some surgeons use it, but be aware, it does cause a lot of scarring, webbing, uh, stenosis, airway fires, uh, perforations, and you know there's a theoretical possibility of uh, inhaling viral particles. So this is just, uh, I'm sure, uh, quite a few of you would have seen or done it. So um, zero degree endoscope in the left hand, you're the brighter on the right hand on a very low setting uh, of 500 um, and it's oscillating, you can just clearly see. Uh, I guess no different than nasal polyps. It's a very controlled movement um, and excision um, with the, uh, and this is clearly, you can see a lot of papillomas in the um, subglottis. Uh, and, good results. There have been uh, some studies. Um, there was this retrospective uh, study which just showed that all the complications occurred with lasers. There were none with the debrider. But of course, in the study, it said more procedures are required with the debrider. There has been another uh, uh, prospective studies. They did not find any difference in the voice of pain in uh, uh, either techniques. And with debrider, it's a lower operative time, the cost is lower. And you don't need any special uh, you know, laser uh, operator in theater. Surgical treatment, yeah, more or less uh, with the cold uh, techniques, we just need a spontaneous breathing technique. But of course, if you're using a laser, then you need an apneic technique or a laser safe tube. Gent ventilation is not a great idea because you're risking uh, distal spread. So be be aware, um, and you know. Um, so severe cases, uh, ten percent of uh, of these uh, kids can require tracheostomy. But again, try your best to decannulate the tracheostomy as as soon as you have disease control. Adjuvant uh, treatments. Uh, so yes, uh, ten percent of uh, kids with severe RRP require some adjuvant treatment. And the criteria is usually if the child is having to come uh, to theaters every four to six weeks, there is distal uh, spread um, and very rapid regrowth with the airway compromise, then you need to think of some um, additional uh, therapies. This is just for mentioning, we don't use it anymore. Um, uh, so alpha interferon used to be used before, the, sort of significant side effects. Uh, this has uh, photodynamic therapy. I'm just mentioning these uh, because we don't use them anymore, be aware. Um, and other antivirals, uh, acyclovir, ribavirin. Sidofovir really is uh, the main adjuvant treatment that uh, we use. It's a, it's a broad uh, spectrum antiviral. Uh, it inhibits the uh, DNA polymerase. Um, for intralesional use, it doesn't have any uh, side effects. Um, I can't say you get complete remission. It, it helps uh, in, in kids, um, adults, uh, better results. Um, there's still a lot of research going on, the optimal doses, how frequently you do it, treatment duration, um, you know, there, there's no definite answers. Uh, there is a, a um, suggestion of, uh, uh, you know, malignant uh, transformation with this. So you have to mention this to the parents because adenocarcinomas have been uh, noted uh, in, in rats. None has been noted in humans to date. Um, Long-term remission, again, no one knows. Um, other things you should again look for reflux, asthma treatment, and future really is HPV vaccine. I'm hoping now with the HPV vaccine being rolled out, both kid, uh, girls and boys now, hopefully in the next 20, 30, 40 years time, when there's herd immunity with this, uh, the papilloma disease uh, will be, uh, I guess, eradicated. So in summary, um, Common to subtypes, uh, type 6 and 11. Uh, lesions are most common at the squamacolumnar junctions. Uh, RRP does not regress with puberty. Malignant transformation is rare, but I'm afraid universally fatal.
Um, and uh, prophylactic uh, cesarean section is not routinely uh, recommended. Uh, but you know you can consider it if it's a young uh, uh, primary uh, para mum with uh, gentle warts. Treatment is uh, essentially all we do is symptom control while waiting for uh, natural disease uh, remission. Um, and really uh, the workhouse is uh, microdebrider plus intralesional sedofovir. Microdebrider is safe, cheap, um, and good. And ultimately, uh, uh, the hope is HPV vaccine. What five minutes, Reshma? So um, we'll just briefly touch on uh, cord palsies. So vocal cord palsies is uh, fairly common. It is the second most common of uh, uh, cause of strider in uh, children, uh, I should say after laryngomalacia. It is uh, in very young kids idiopathic, not always, you know, you can find any underlying cause. In older ch uh, children, it's more iatrogenic. Uh, of course, left cord pulse is uh, more common than the right. Uh, in the congenital ones, uh, uh, rule out or at least get your pediatricians to check out uh, congenital heart disease, CNS uh, issues um, can sometimes be seen in Downs kids also. Acquired ones, again, um, can be secondary to infections. Uh, um, iatrogenic, especially the most common one we see is uh, uh, cardiac surgery, PD ligations, TOF repairs, uh, intubations. So these are the ones I commonly see um, iatrogenic wise. So this is just, uh, I'm sure you've seen all uh, vocal cord pulses, but just watch carefully this video and you can clearly see the right cord is moving well. So even the left arytenoids you see is moving well, but the left cord is not abducting on inspiration. Rather on inspiration, the arytenoid gets sucked in uh, more due to negative pressure. So you can clearly see the right is moving, left is not moving. And this is a right one. So again, watch. So this one, you can clearly see the left is moving very well. The right one is not moving. Uh, or it shows it's moving, but you've got to really sit there and watch it for 30, 40 seconds. So management, of course, depends on uh, area compromise. If the child is managing well regarding breathing and the only problem is the voice, then yes. Any child you've uh, picked up uh, a unilateral cord palsy and you can't see any obvious cause, um, yes, send them for a scan and also get their swallowing assessment uh, checked out. Of course, you would have taken the history, but these are two, three things. Don't, don't forget the speech, the uh, swallowing and the scan. Try your best not to be uh, or doing any destructive treatment in kids because uh, spontaneous recovery occurs after several years. I wrote a paper, looked at a series uh, uh, during my fellowship years and off the top of my head uh, of the 15, 20 odd cases, uh, almost more than half recovered and one of the kids recovered at age six, uh, something like that. So it, it really can recover after many, many years. Of course, in the extreme cases, you might um, end up doing a tracheostomy. But again, as I said, don't mess up with the vocal cords as such. Give them a tracheostomy and you know, over time, you might be able to decanulate them. Either the cord um, improves or generally the child is able to manage. But yes, of course, uh, uh, you can do erythrinoidectomies or uh, transfers, uh, uh, cordotomies, just, just illustrating here, um, all you're doing is creating some um, space. And in the chordotomy, you simply are just uh, separating the vocal ligament from the erythroids, and when it heals, it just creates uh, some space. So I think, um, Reshma, I'm gonna stop there, because uh, 40 minutes really. That's absolutely fine, brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, Prof, for sharing your experience. Um, I wanted to ask a question myself. So I've been caught out once um, with bilateral vocal cord palsies in a neonate, yep. and therefore I got it the second time round, but I think it is hard. Um, do you have any advice and tips about that referral? No, so the bilateral cord palsies are very difficult 
to even unilateral are very difficult to diagnose on a flexiscope. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, even in a little kid with a flexiscope, you know, you max get 15, 20 seconds. Uh, so yeah, you know, sometimes it's very obvious, but actually majority of the time it's not obvious. If it doesn't make sense, you know, have a formal endoscopy. Even on a formal endoscopy, uh, I haven't uh, got illustrations here, but maybe uh, I should put up some videos. Bilateral cord pulses are very difficult to diagnose because, as you know, it's really when the kid is waking up, that's the time when, when we assess the vocal cord uh, mobility and you keep sitting, keep sitting, and suddenly, you know, you see no movement and the kid is almost biting you. So, uh, so I think bilateral cord pulses are... Uh, difficult to uh, diagnose, uh, s- certainly on a uh, flexiscope. Um, so yes, as I said, if not sure, and many times the only presentation might be, oh, the kid is aphonic, no voice. Uh, they might not have any stridors at all. Mm. If somehow the cords are uh, fixed on, fixed in a sort of, uh, you know, cadaveric or uh, abducted position. They, they might not have any strider. It might just simply, and I've picked a few from the a smart uh, speech and language therapist uh, will pick it up, uh, uh, that, oh, this, this kid is completely aphonic, no cry. Uh, so I think that you, you seriously consider uh, bilateral cord pulses in those kids and formally um, scope them. I think we have the luxury at the Royal London of yep. being able to perform um, MLBs quite readily but what advice would you give um to people working at dghs i mean reshma you know i have a very low threshold of uh, scopes because i've seen it all uh, you know i yes most of the time on a history and examination i have an idea um that oh yeah this is what it's going to be but I can still tell you I'm not correct 100%. I'm max correct 90%. I still get surprises after uh, so many years. Mm. So, yes, if you're not sure, you know, just ask for a formal endoscopy. Formal airway endoscopy these days is very safe in a proper setup. Um, so that's the answer. You cannot always uh, diagnose on a, uh, on a flexiscope. Great. So thank you, everyone, and see you next week.